It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. What's up? What's happening? Welcome in. It's the Take Command podcast. That is Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. And with us for the full show today, how lucky are we to have Charles Davis from the NFL Network, a part of their draft coverage all the way through the NFL Draft, which, of course, you can watch on the NFL Network. You got uh, Paths of the Draft nightly at 6. You got Total Access at 7. Charles, now your bosses are happy. I have plugged the programming. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, you. Now we are okay for liftoff. All right. Before that, <laughs> one runway until all the announcements were in. You guys fly a lot. I fly a lot. My biggest question with my airline people, I have to admit it, is the incessant announcements. Mm, yeah. And have you noticed when the when the pilot comes on and announces they've started the initial descent, everyone buckle up, start returning things, etc. Go three, two, one, and then a flight attendant comes on and says, the <laughs> and I've not figured that part out yet. <laughs> but anyway. I think, Charles, when we fly to Detroit next week, we should just ask our flight attendants. Be like, hey, ma'am, I, or sir, I have, I have a question for question. you. I have a question. You know, you know what we ought to do? We ought to pull 10 of them, and I bet you we'll get seven to eight ants. Seven to eight ants. <laughs> Guaranteed. I, I think we should both ask. We got at least because I mean, uh, Logan's Logan's staying put in Ashburn for this, I'm one, but I'm headed close. to Detroit on Thursday. You're headed to Detroit. That's at least four flights. I don't know if you have any connections to get there. I'm I'm well, luckily so we'll straight through. Out. So we'll talk afterwards and see what right. we get. Compare compare <laughs> notes. I love it. Um, all right, so we we're gonna start comparing notes. Uh, we will eventually compare notes on corner, uh, linebacker, some positions that we haven't talked about a ton leading up to this process, but certainly ones that Washington is going to be looking at. Of course, Charles uh, played safety back in the day, so the DB's right up his alley, uh, but certainly capable of breaking down every position uh, in this draft. But I wanted to start with kind of a bigger picture uh, conversation uh, about the draft. And uh, Alec Lewis wrote a really good piece in The Athletic about draft strategy and how teams have spent a lot of time researching like what they should do and they know that they are supposed to trade back and that more picks is better and yet they still on draft day can't help themselves they'll trade up and sometimes it works because sometimes you trade up for Patrick Mahomes but uh, more often than not there are certain things that teams know they should do they can't help themselves and one of the things that we had Alec on the radio show and, and he said he thinks one of the biggest advantages that a team can have this time of year is an owner with a long term thinking. And Charles, you've been covering the draft for a long time. Uh, Logan, you've been thinking about it from the, your playing days. And obviously we talk about it at nauseum uh, here from January uh, through April. So I'm just curious for both of you guys and Charles, we'll start with you kind of the, the Josh Harris era and and how a guy that comes from the finance world, the the this kind of long long-term thinking, how it can be an advantage for the commanders as they uh, they prepare for uh, this draft? Yeah, I think the biggest advantage is simply him being brand new. I mean, people have been looking for a breath of fresh air for a long time, and then you have an owner come in and, you know, I don't know how many things were startling, groundbreaking, earth-shaking in, in moves that he's made already, probably not much of anything, but almost everything was positive because it wasn't Dan Snyder. That's your starting point. The next thing is, if he's got long-term thinking, he's going into this with the idea that he has to have a quarterback out of this. But that's not just because this owner has to have a quarterback that he can squire around town and say, this is my quarterback, a la Sonny Werblin and Joe Namath back in the day, a la Dan Snyder doing that with Robert Griffin III. This is much more, this franchise has to have that leader, has to have that person who is in charge, is the face of the franchise, and gives us good play. That's why you're hearing the reports of Josh Harris sitting in on quarterback meetings, right? Meeting all these quarterback candidates that are coming to town. It's as big a decision as Washington has made in a long time football-wise. And having the long term is a big deal, knowing that it's not just for the amusement of the owner, it's for the franchise, and can we get that person that allows us to get back into winning division championships, playoffs, and getting back to Super Bowls. 
Yeah, 100%. I also think that like when you have that longitudinal vision, you see teams like the Baltimore Ravens, the Pittsburgh Steelers, teams that have been kind of very proactive in keeping the continuity of the organization and like they have a very strong cultural identity which helps it which helps them draft more effectively, right? They can right Charles, they can identify people that say, "Hey, this is what it means to be a Raven. This is what it means to be a Steeler because that doesn't change every 3 years. You're not having to turn over teams, you're not having to turn over personnel and then kind of like keeping, like if you if you're willing to be patient with your head coach and your GM, they can kind of establish this cultural identity. So I do think that that long term benefit is really helpful. And also, I think you know, like Charles was talking about with the quarterback, it's extremely important to have to kind of have that again a long term vision for that player because they're not going to be a final version of themselves in year one. It's like what are they going to be in year three, year four? And I'm not going to punt on this player just because I don't ex- get exactly what I want in year one. So I do think having kind of again a long term vision for the process is extremely important because I think ultimately like the best teams, like the teams I just described, Philadelphia when they were rolling a couple of years ago, they're really good at developing talent internally, and that's a long term process. It's not a short term flash in the pan type of moment moment helps build that culture because again even if i'm really active in free agency bringing in strong players and strong personalities are they perfect cultural fits i don't know till they're in the building here i can kind of build that up from from the foundation to the rafters and i think that again is it all starts with the new ownership and i think that's pretty exciting so and and craig let me just piggyback on that because log has made so many great points i'm going to zero in on patience the word patience Mm -hmm. The Baltimore Ravens went through a stretch with John Harbaugh as a head coach where they went, what, four straight years they didn't make the playoffs or something like that, or they went eight and eight or somewhere in that neighborhood, right? It just wasn't quite up to snuff. And there was a lot of pressure from us media types, right? Look, you know, and you guys know, if you're in the media and you work in the media, you're one, you're part of the media. You always <laughs> We, well, we try really, our best, but yet here we are. Right, but, but you know, you know those people that we work with that go, well, you know, I'm really not part of the media. I'm just kind of, mm-hmm. well, you're part of the media, okay? Right. Just deal with it, right? <laughs> but there's a lot of pressure. Hey, he's not getting it done. He's not getting us to where we used to be. And I know it wasn't easy, but let's face it. That ownership had the hard decisions, had the hard conversations. Do we still think we're headed in the right direction? Do we have to tweak some things to get to where we want to go? Do we have to make some changes in certain things? Am I going to ask my head coach to do some things differently, but I still believe in my head coach? They did all of that. What's been the reward? They're back to being that perennial playoff team again. Last year was a major disappointment because they didn't advance to the Super Bowl. They got to the AFC Championship game. They were good enough to get there. That's what you want to be year in and year out. I love how the Pittsburgh people are all upset with Mike Tomlin. I'm tired of us just – every year Mike Tomlin finishes over 500. Like, that's a big deal. That team last year had no business winning 10 games. None. And they did. Okay? So they do this all the time, and people act like it's no big deal. So, Logan, I think you make such a great point about having the patience, having the understanding. Now, what I tell people all the time is, do you really think Mike Tomlin is happy just being 500? (laughs) 500 every year you really think that's what fuels him at night no they're trying to find a way to get better and get there too but you know something you want to have that or do you want to have one of those organizations where as logan has pointed out every two or three years you're hitting a reset button and you're fighting to get into 500 in the first place thank you i think i think you've made excellent points on that and that's where washington wants to get to no doubt. And I think that also leads to kind of the next thing I wanted to talk about. It's like another branch off this tree, if you will, which is the ability to try stuff and, and kind of be different than other organizations with this new fresh perspective that Josh Harris has. And he's been an owner in other sports. He's been very successful. I, I think that the Sixers uh, for him are kind of a, a different version of, of what you're talking about with the Steelers, Charles, where it's like they win 50 games every year and everyone hates Josh Harris and thinks he's a terrible <laughs> owner in Philly. And I'm sitting here as someone who covers the Wizards as well, being like they haven't won 50 games since 1978. So what are we talking about? <laughs> um, and, and so I think that the ability to, to have tried things in other sports, such as uh, bringing in multiple prospects together. That's kind of the hot topic as we sit here recording this on, on Thursday, April 18th. Uh, yesterday, they brought in all the different quarterbacks together and people are freaking out and you know trying to read uh, uh, what does this emoji that Jaden Daniels' agent tweeted out mean? And it's like, wow, we really have reached the uh, peak of silly season here a week before the draft, haven't we? Um, but, but I think that uh, as we figure out the people, and Logan and I were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, like getting a chance to see 
these quarterbacks interact with each other and see how they are in a lunchroom, see how they are uh, in a meeting room where there's multiple people there. And there's kind of this camaraderie that you want to understand who they are. And you're not just reliant on coaches who have an incentive to get their guy drafted to tell you the truth. And sure, sure you might have good relationships, but you get to see it for yourself. I love that. I love thinking differently because the the draft is, even for the best teams, such a crapshoot. Ozzy Newsom famously will tell you that if you know you want to get seven good players, have 14 picks. It's not about right. trying to target your right ones. It, it like he is someone who lived that multiple pick strategy. So I'm also just kind of curious what you guys think on, on that front, the idea of trying different things. And by the way, Belichick used to bring in a dozen guys. He talked about that on the McAfee show yesterday. So it's not completely new. But doing things differently, being willing to try things and, and you know, that that longitudinal approach where, you know, if you're a GM or a coach and you try something that doesn't work, you're not you don't have the fear that you're immediately then going to get fired uh, because it didn't work in year one. Yeah, let me hop in real quick because I want to get Logan into this one. Logan, I don't want to take you away from where you wanted to go, but I want you to add to this. All right, because it's a question I would have from a person who was in there in locker rooms and saw all of this, right, from the time you came out of college to combines, to workouts, to, you know, your team building, everything that goes along with it. What you were bringing up, Craig, and bringing in these four quarterbacks, my immediate thought was, first, I was a little bit snarky. I was like, oh, boy, this is kind of fun, right? Steel cage match. Whoever emerges <laughs> out of here is going to be our draft pick. Ha, 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 ha. But I thought back to combine situations. I thought back to recruiting trips, okay? I thought back to any group dynamics where you're putting a number of the same type of players or same position players in and seeing how it sifts out. How do people respond to them? How do they respond to each other? Who ultimately shows that he is that person or has that thing that you're looking for depending on what team you're on? So Logan, whatever you want to go, I don't want to take you away from that. I'd love to have you talk about when quarterbacks are coming together, positions are coming together. Because I'll end it with this. There's a great story that George Plimpton, I don't know if you guys know that name. He was a great writer, and he wrote a book about trying out for the Detroit Lions. Yes, yeah. yeah. yeah it was called Paper Lion back, I think it was 1963 or somewhere. Yeah. And he, they tried to sneak him into camp and have some cover story. And he was, a, he was a, a writer who was going through the NFL stuff. And he did a lot of these projects. He pitched. He played goalie. He boxed with Archie Moore. He did all those nutty things, right? But it was great writing. It was great journalism. The book I've read more than 10 times. I've loved it. But in that book and then in a subsequent book called Mad Ducks and Bears, he detailed going to the Pro Bowl. And he was, on the East, he was with the Eastern Conference Pro Bowl team. Ali Sherman was the coach of the Giants. He coached the team. They didn't have a meeting. They didn't have a depth chart. You'll love this one, Logan. They went out on the field for the first time. Oh, yeah. I've heard this. Yeah. Yep. You heard this story, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, Craig, you're going to love this. Give me the first team offense over the ball. Now, these are the all-stars. This is the best of the best. They all looked at Now, this would have been 1960-something, right? 62, 63, 64, when Alex Sherman was at his heyday. They all looked at each other took the measure of each other, and 11 guys walked out in the right That's position. That's incredible. Yeah. Now, think about nowadays. Now you have a steel cage match going. Okay, I yeah. get all that. But I'm saying they understood who the best was. That feels a lot like what you're trying to do when you're bringing these groups together. Logan, everything you want now that I've gone so long. <laughs> and please, please, if you could try and respond to that part for me because I'm trying to learn too. No, I think that's a great point. And that's something that I think that's what you're looking for, right? Is you're looking when these guys come together. Like I just remember, like I do combine prep, right? Like, and when you go to the, go to the facility, there's a bunch of tight ends. There's a bunch of old linemen. And what I'd like to do is just kind of sit in the room and watch them interact. Like, do they get along? Is anyone standoffish? Is anyone kind of combative? I also love to see when guys start talking ball, like who's the football junkie? Like when, you know, like just as an example, does JJ McCarthy go up to Drake May and be like, hey man, I love how you ran that zone read. Like what were your rules on that? And just trying to digest more football. And like, so you get kind of to peel back the layer of the guy in a way that you wouldn't get if they were in on their individual visit. Because the only person they're talking to, they know is important. But like, 
for example, like you're, you know, at these combine preps or when they would bring guys in before you, they'd sit down at the table. Some guys are super buttoned up. Other guys are laughing and joking and bringing other guys over. Hey man, come on. Sit. I want that type of guy in my room. I want a culture where we're bringing people along and that's a different type of leadership, but that's a type of leadership. And you don't get to see that if I'm by myself, because the only person I'm talking to is Dan Quinn and Adam Peters. And I don't get to be the person I want to be. So I think it just, again, helps kind of open the book on the athlete a little bit. And I've heard stories of guys coming for visits with just the coaches and the coaches like, I never got a feel for who he was as a person. And then they'd bring him in with four or five other guys or they get him in a setting with four or five other guys, whether that's at the combine, right? As pro day. And it's like, that's who he is. And so I think this setting, you know, taking him out to dinner with a bunch of guys, taking him to top golf or whatever they did, that's super important for seeing the person. And seeing what type of guy you're bringing in and see if it gets compatible with the culture you have in the building. So I think it's extremely important. And Logan, when you, when you see some of these things, because sometimes when these guys come together, there's often that little bit of, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one, right? Yeah. More times than not, in my experience, that person who's emerged as the guy didn't have to work at it. He just mm. was. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I no, think that's sure. right. I think the other point there that Charles brings up is like, what is your demeanor when you're in the, like, cause this is a competitive situation, right? Can you still be a good teammate while also knowing, having the, the self-assured confidence that you're the guy? So I think that's exactly right. Like it's what, it, those are only interactions you get in when they're all together. And I don't care what position, where they're from. I don't get that if I'm just talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. I get that when I'm sitting back, I'm Dan at, at the event and I'm watching how you talk to each other and how you interact. So I think that's why this is such a cool, cool thing. And I, and you know, people are kind of saying that it's new, but I, I mean, Charles, when I was playing, Craig, when I was playing, like I remember them doing that all the time. You'd be in a workout, they'd be trotting guys through the weight room for their weigh-ins, talking to the strength coach. You're like, Oh, I guess it's the 30 visit day and there's 15 guys <laughs> there. So I, it doesn't seem like that new to me, but whatever. No, I don't, no. I don't think it's new at all. Logan, I think you made a great point. I can't remember if it was you or Craig talked about Bill Belichick talked about how he would bring in those groups of people. Everyone does different things with group dynamics, but for all future players who are going to go to the combine and Logan, I need you to either tell me if I'm way off track or if I'm somewhere in the neighborhood, if you're going to the combine, one thing you will be evaluated on is how you are in group dynamics. When you think no one's watching you, whether 1, you're having thousand percent, whether, whether you're going down the hall to go meet with other teams, whether you were on time for all that, and then, hey, excuse me, sir, I have to go because I have to be at such and such place. Or during the combine workout itself, mm -hmm. coaches love to have everybody because it's your group. The tight ends are working out. The DBs are working out. The offensive linemen are working out. Yes, you're there for you. But these coaches want to see you help someone else. They want to see you do the right thing for someone else. They want to see how that group responds and see if all of a sudden there's four or five guys clustered around one other person. Is yeah. that that person? Who is that guy? That's that's These are all the things that go into it. Does it always predict it accurately? Not always, but I'd say more times than not. Yeah. No, yeah, I absolutely. agree. And I think like you look at like Roma Dunze. Sorry, Craig. You look at Roma Dunze. You're on the field for this, Charles. You know, but Roma Dunze, when he's doing his drill work, and I think he's, he's still going, isn't he? Yeah, but he's like he's like <laughs> like even even when he's running routes, like he's dapping people up. People are supporting him there, and like he's bringing people with him. And I want to see that. And you talk to people that night going out to dinner or whatever, and they're like, "Oh, so and so receiver, they were rude to the nurse at the hospital today." And I don't want that guy here. And you're like, so they're always paying attention, they're always watching, but because you're, it's the the stuff on the field is important. But ultimately, how's that guy going to be in the building? And like you said, you only see that in these group setting interactions. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I'm going to stop with Odunze, but my joke about Odunze is he's still going. <laughs> you guys remember, he wanted a standard for himself at that mm. combine. And remember, he ran his three cone and did not like his time. Yeah. And he kept doing it and doing it and doing it until he hit his time. This, 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 is, this, is, this is someone now. We just left the Masters, right? And what do they say about golfers? You don't play against other golfers. You play against the the, the course. Yeah. That was Madunze playing the course. It's pretty impressive. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I, I've certainly, in my reporting days, had position coaches and personnel execs say the same thing. Like, I want to know who that leader is in the group. Like, who's the guy that breaks down the, the wide receiver group? Who's the guy that breaks down the quarterback group? Like, they pay attention. But I will say this real quick, because I do feel like sometimes we can get really into the personnel dynamics. 
it's a part of the evaluation. And that's what I think fans need to remember is if the commanders hated a guy's tape at quarterback, let's say for the number two pick, mm. and they thought he wasn't very good, but he's awesome in the building, they're not going to draft him. So no. it, it's not like this overrides everything else, but it's a piece of the evaluation. And I, Logan, as we've talked about quarterback, especially over the last month and kind of thrown our hands up going, I have no idea who they should take because we like certain elements of all of the three main guys in competition here. Um, there is like th this personnel dynamic might wind up being the deciding factor, but it's only because everything else is even. If this is this is a tiebreaker, this is an important part of the the evaluation, but it's not the entire evaluation. It's an element. Look, we all played ball. We all did things growing up, right? You remember that senior who could barely get his pads on, but some but he was named captain yeah, because yeah. you know he's a senior and he's a good guy and he was named captain. So sometimes, we, to your point, Craig, we get caught up in things. Sometimes, like how many times we go through this. Well, the starting quarterback in the NFL doesn't have the C on his jersey. Mm. Oh, my God. Sometimes it can be too much, right? But, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he doesn't because he's a rookie, okay? So <laughs> don't slap it on him because he's a rookie. Now, some of them earn it. C.J. Stroud earned it in about two days in Houston. Some of them have to grow into it. I remember a player in this league, a big-time player, and I'm not going to use his name because it's not fair to him, but he was named a captain. And then when a new coach came in, he took the captaincy from him because he said, you're just not there yet. You know, that couldn't be easy for him. But it's just all a matter of the process of what people are looking for and sometimes earning it, not earning it. So, Craig, I think you make a great point. It's a part of it. And by the way, that player got the captaincy taken from him. His play didn't decline. He was still mm -hmm. a terrific football player and probably was even a little more ticked off because they took the C <laughs> from him. But all that being said, it's a, it's a part of the evaluation. It isn't a total evaluation. We have to make sure we understand the context of all this that goes into it. You're exactly right. The greatest guy ever who can't throw it 10 yards is not your starting quarterback. No, certainly not the number two pick. No, not even, <laughs> not even undrafted free agent because if Logan Paulson's going out and running, for, run out, running routes for passes and Charles Davis can't reach him throwing the football, then Charles Davis needs to go home. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think Charles Davis can go to the broadcast booth, though. I heard he's pretty good at that. He's pretty good. <laughs> he, yeah. needs, he needs to take it and take it to the house because we're wasting Logan Paulson's time. All right. Anyway. <laughs>